In this video, we will take a closer look at the design of components subjected to bearing stress. When two components are in contact, they generally exert forces on each other. This is the case, for example, with gears whose tooth flanks are in contact and transmit forces. The same applies to a keyed joint, where the torque of the shaft is transferred to the gear through the contact surface of the key. When a component rests in a recess, force is also transmitted through the contact surface. The distribution of force per unit area between two contacting surfaces is referred to as contact pressure or bearing pressure. Contact pressure, as a measure of load intensity, is defined as the ratio between force and the contact area. In principle, this definition is analogous to the definition of stress under tensile or compressive loading. In contrast to compressive stress, which acts inside a component, bearing pressure acts on the contact surface between two components. It is therefore denoted by the letter P rather than by the Greek letter sigma, which is used for internal stress. For this reason, the contact area is usually denoted by the capital letter A rather than by the symbol S used for a cross-sectional area. As with other types of loading, a maximum allowable bearing pressure must not be exceeded, otherwise the contact surfaces may be damaged. Therefore, the actual bearing pressure must always remain below or at most equal to the allowable bearing pressure. For ductile materials, such as steel, the allowable bearing pressure can be estimated from the yield strength for preliminary calculations. As a guideline for static loading, the allowable bearing pressure should be at least a factor of 1.2 below the yield strength. For cast iron, a higher safety factor should be selected. After rearranging the bearing pressure formula, the given external force and the maximum permissible bearing pressure can be used to determine the minimum required contact area for dimensioning the component. Let us consider the illustrated example in which the upper component presses onto the contact surface of a recess with a constant force of 30 kilonewtons. The recess has a width of 20 millimeters. Both components are made of the unalloyed steel grade E360. In the following, we determine the minimum required length L of the recess to ensure that the allowable bearing pressure is not exceeded. First, we need the material's yield strength to estimate the allowable bearing pressure. The yield strength is taken from the steel designation E360. The number 360 represents the yield strength of 360 newtons per square millimeter. Dividing this value by 1.2 gives an allowable bearing pressure of approximately 300 newtons per square millimeter, which must not be exceeded at the contact surface. With this allowable bearing pressure and the acting force of 30,000 newtons, we can now determine the minimum required contact area. In this case, it amounts to 100 square millimeters. The rectangular bearing area results from the product of the given width of the recess and the required length. After rearranging the formula and inserting the numerical values, we obtain a minimum required length of 5 millimeters. With this length, the maximum allowable bearing pressure of 300 newtons per square millimeter is not exceeded. Now let us consider the case in which the contact surface is not flat, but curved. This occurs, for example, when a pin is placed in a bore and is subjected to a force. Although the force is distributed along a curved surface section, this curved surface is not relevant for determining the bearing pressure as the ratio of force to area. This becomes clear if we imagine the curved surface to consist of infinitely many small steps. It immediately becomes evident that the applied force acts only on the horizontal portions of these steps. These are marked in yellow in the illustration. The vertical portions, however, are not loaded by the force. The force essentially acts past these areas. They contribute no load-bearing capability and therefore are not subjected to bearing pressure. For calculating bearing pressure, only those surface portions that act in the direction of the force are relevant, that is, the area projected in the direction of the applied load. This projected area can be visualized as the shadow cast on a flat surface when the loaded object is illuminated by a flashlight. In this case, the projected area is therefore a rectangular area with the width d corresponding to the diameter of the pin and the length l of the contact surface. Let us also consider an example for this case. A rod is attached between the two forks of a clevis using a pin. The rod is statically loaded with a force of 80 kilonewtons. The pin has a diameter of 20 millimeters and is subjected to bearing pressure by the clevis. The allowable bearing pressure on the pin must not exceed 80 newtons per square millimeter. The question is, 
How wide must the clevis width B be in order to ensure that the allowable bearing pressure is not exceeded? First, we determine the minimum required contact area based on the force with which the pin is pressed into the clevis. It must be considered that although the rod exerts a downward force of 80 kN on the pin, this force is shared equally between the two sides of the clevis. One side of the clevis therefore loads the pin with 40 kN. This force is distributed over the yellow highlighted bearing surface in the clevis. With the bearing pressure determined using the projected rectangular area, this area is the product of the pin diameter D and the clevis width B. Note that for clarity, the bearing surface is drawn into the plane of the sectional view in the illustration. In reality, the surface is projected downward. Now, using the acting force of 40,000 newtons and the allowable bearing pressure of 80 newtons per square millimeter, we determine the minimum required contact area, which in this case amounts to 500 square millimeters. After rearranging the formula for the rectangular bearing area and substituting the numerical values, we obtain a minimum required clevis width of 25 millimeters. With this width, it is ensured that the maximum allowable bearing pressure of 80 newtons per square millimeter is not exceeded. Note that we have implicitly assumed that the width of the rod is significantly larger than the width of the clevis arms. This ensures that the highest bearing pressure occurs between the clevis and the pin. Otherwise, it would also be necessary to check whether the allowable bearing pressure is met between the rod and the pin. Also note that the pin is additionally subjected to shear loading. Whether the pin can withstand this shear load must also be verified. We discuss shear loading of pins in a separate video.